glad you are here today. Glad you remembered to set your clocks at the right time to, uh, to be blessed and be sharing together in God's Word. If you would, please, open up your Bibles to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 11 is where we're going to be. We are continuing in a sermon series that we've called simply, Being the Church with Excellence. And our theme verses are over here on the wall. And we have learned that the early church was devoted to prayer. That's what is in part made them such an excellent church. And so them being our model, we want to be the church that is excellent like they were excellent. And so we've been uh, uh, directing our attention to being the praying church. And here's what we've learned so far in this sermon series on prayer. We started where the disciples started. The disciples were with Jesus for quite some time, and they came to Jesus, and they had a, they had a request. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so that's where we've started this entire series on prayer, that there are some things that we can be taught in regards to prayer. Even if we've been a Christian for 30 and 40 years, we've asked God's Spirit to open our eyes and help us to realize maybe some new aspects of prayer. And so that's where we started. But then last week, if you were here, we talked about becoming a circle maker and what that was all about. Uh, in Joshua chapter 6, you remember that story. It was the story of the original circle makers. Joshua was the leader of the Israelites at this time. Moses is dead and gone. And they're getting ready to capture the promised land that God promised to the nation of Israel hundreds of years before. And finally, they're on the verge of getting the promise that God has for them. But only one thing stood in the way, and that was the city of Jericho. And so God commanded Joshua and the people of Israel to march around the city every day for six days. And on the seventh day, they had to march around seven times. And after they did that, the walls fell flat. And what we learned about that is that as we're circling prayer requests, is there are certain things that you're dedicated to praying for and about, those obstacles in your life, those things that stand between you and the promise that God wants to give you, as you're praying about those things, there are two things we learned about that. First, you have to trust God's promises, and second, you have to be specific with your prayers. Remember last week we encouraged you to be specific in what you ask God for because generic prayers produce generic results. And so now as we continue in our efforts to be the church that is striving for excellence in the area of prayer by continually being devoted to it, I want to start off by asking you this question this morning. What is the biggest prayer you have ever prayed? What is the thing that you have come to God with and just prayed really big for? Think about that. And maybe you're like this morning, well, I'm having a hard time coming up with that. And maybe you're having a hard time coming up with that because in reality, a lot of times our prayers are small, aren't they? I think it's right, it's time that we right-sized God. You know what I mean? I mean, sometimes we, we get God out of perspective, and so our prayers as we bring them before him are small, for lack of a better term, small. Sometimes we make ourselves seem so much bigger than God, right? Well, I don't need to bother God with this. I'll just handle this problem myself. I'm not going to pray about it because I'm bigger than my problem is, and, well, I can handle that. So we make ourselves seem bigger than our problem. But other times, it's the other problem we have. It's that our problems, we make our problems seem bigger than God, right? Well, this is just too big to handle. The doctors have told me it's terminal. I'm not going to bother God. I'm just going to ask for God's comfort to be brought to me. Listen, God is bigger than your cancer. God is bigger than the stubbornness of your child. God is bigger than the hardness of your spouse's heart. God is bigger than your checking account. And why is it that we tend to forget how big God is? It was said that Teddy Roosevelt would oftentimes go outside at night with a, with a friend and they would look up into the stars together, just silently looking up into the stars. Oftentimes they would do this. And after a period of silence and reflection, Teddy Roosevelt would simply say, well, I think we feel small enough now. Let's go to bed. And I think sometimes you and I have got to have that exact same um, idea. We got to get the, we got to right size God. He's big. He's really, really big. And if you're facing a problem and you haven't right-sized God, 
and you haven't right-sized the problem, then perhaps maybe what you need is you need a fresh perspective on how big God is. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 reminds us that God is big enough to do more than we could possibly ever think or imagine. That is how big God is. And maybe our prayers are small because our thinking is small. In Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9, Isaiah reminds us again how great and big God is. It says in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Um, side note, I hope you're planning on coming in just two weeks to How Great Is Our God? It, it, it's it's going to be an impactful evening, and you probably have seen the video before, but we have postcards we want to encourage you to hand out to your friends, to your neighbors, to bring them here, because I think we as a church, we as a community, we as a country need to right-size God again. One thing we've learned from Louis Giglio about the universe and indescribable is that our universe is vast. It's gargantuan. And to get around in God's universe, you remember the measurement that, that we have to use to even get around in God's universe because it's so big. The foot isn't going to do you a whole a lot of good in God's universe. The mile isn't even going to do you a whole lot of good in God's universe. We've got to use a measurement called a light year. And let me remind you what a light year is. First, what you have to do to determine a light year is you have to remember how fast light travels. 186,000 miles every second. That's zipping right along, in case you didn't know. And so what we need to do then is we calculate how, how far light travels in a year. If light is traveling 186,000 miles every second, how many seconds are in a year, you multiply that by how many miles it is, and you get this, uh, this mind-boggling number. 5.88 trillion miles is how far light travels in a year. And so we use measurements in God's universe called the light year. Well, here's something that maybe you didn't realize. Astrophysicists don't for sure know how far the universe expands. But what they have uh, seen with the, the Hubble telescope is they have discovered the edge of the visible universe. And the edge of the visible universe, how far we can see, is 90 th 98 billion light years away. Let me just help you with that math just a little bit. You take 5.88 trillion miles and you multiply that by 98 billion and you get how many miles away the edge of our universe is. And that isn't even for sure. That's just what we can see. And Isaiah reminds us, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so is the distance between God's thoughts and ways and our thoughts and ways. Translation, your best thought on your best day is far inferior to God's thoughts and plans. God's greatness and his goodness is incomprehensible. Expect big things from a big God. That's what, that's what we're getting at here this morning. And in fact, there's only one point to the entire message this morning, and I don't want you to miss it. Here it is. You ready? Pray big. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is to pray big. When tragedy strikes or difficulties come, pray big. We just spent some time reassuring you that God is big. So since you're praying to a big God, why, do, why then do we offer such small prayers? Shouldn't we ask big things from a big God? Shouldn't we hope for big things from a big God? This morning, the title of the sermon is Small People, Big Prayers. And one thing I want you to understand is that the Bible is filled with people who prayed big. Joshua prayed big. He was the leader of the Israelites, and, and he was engaged in a battle against the Amorites. And in Joshua chapter 10, you're, you're going to know this story once I tell you. Joshua chapter 10, he prays a big, big prayer. You see, the sun was beginning to set, and Joshua didn't want any of those Am Amorites to escape in the darkness. And so he prayed a big prayer. And in verses 12 through 14, Joshua prays for the sun and the moon to stand still. That's a pretty big prayer. Hey, God, um, 
make the sun not set tonight. That's a pretty big prayer. But you know what? God answered Joshua. The sun and the moon stood still, and Joshua was able to defeat the enemies of the Lord. He's not alone in praying big. Elijah prayed big. Elijah is famous for a lot of awesome things in Scripture, but um, one of the things uh, that you need to know about Elijah that, is that as his story opens, we find him upset with King Ahab's actions. King Ahab had turned the kingdom of Israel away from God and, and was encouraging them to worship a false god named Baal. And so in order to turn King Ahab back to God, Elijah prayed for a drought to come upon the land. And God shut the heavens up for three and a half years. There was no rain. That's what James chapter 5 verse 17 tells us. So Elijah hides from the king because if you're the one responsible for a drought in the land, you're probably not going to be real popular. And so Elijah hides from the king. And he hides near a brook. And there the Lord provides for Elijah miraculously. He uses ravens to help bring him food. How would you like to be fed by ravens? You know, that's a gross thought, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I don't know how that looked exactly, but I'm, I have this. I have this horrible Im image where they're regurgitating food and all that. So I don't know how that worked. But basically, Elijah was being miraculously taken care of by God. But soon, the brook that he was living near dries up because, well, after all, it hasn't rained for three and a half years. And so because of the drought that's ongoing, Elijah has to move to Zarephath, and there he runs into a widow who was using the last of her flour and oil to make a meal for her and her son. God makes a promise to that widow and says that he will never allow her oil and flour to run dry as long as she will fix food and take care of Elijah. So she agrees. And the story of Elijah that I want you to focus on picks up in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 22. It says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Elijah replied, Give me your son. So Elijah took his son from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. And then he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And then Elijah stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Verse 22, the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. You talk about a big prayer. You talk about a bold prayer. Here's where I think we get confused and then we become timid with our prayers. We think that God will somehow be offended or dishonored when we pray big, bold prayers. We think, well, how can I do that? I'm not Elijah. I'm not Moses. I'm not Joshua. I'm just, who am I? But listen, quite the opposite is true. Big, bold prayers honor God. And in return, God honors big, bold prayers. In fact, I think God is offended by anything less than a big, bold prayer. If your prayers aren't impossible to you, they're insulting to God because they don't require his divine intervention. But ask God to part the Red Sea or make the sun stand still or to float an iron axe head, and God is moved to omnipotent action. So that brings us to our text this morning in Numbers chapter 11. And the reason I've selected Numbers chapter 11 is because I want to remind you specifically this morning how generous, how gracious, how miraculous God really is. In Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse 1, Now the people became like those who complain of adversity, adversity in, the, in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. I probably need to fill you in on what's happening here, okay? So here we have the Israelite people have been now moved from Egypt. They were slaves. They were led out by Moses, and now they're kind of doing their wandering thing for 40 years in the wilderness. And the people, well, they weren't happy about wandering in the wilderness. And so what people are sometimes known to do when the conditions are unfavorable, they complain. And that's what we have seeing here. And God wasn't happy about their complaints, by the way. Verse 2. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberah, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. 
The rabble who were among them had greedy desires, and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who's going to give us some meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat for free in Egypt, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our appetite's gone. There's nothing at all to look at except this manna. Wow, those people were having a huge pity party. Oh, poor us. All we have to eat day in and day out is miraculous bread that God gives us. Poor us. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever complained to God because of the blessings that he gives? So in verses 7 through 9, um, Moses kind of does us a favor and he describes what manna was like. Because as manna is being described here, aren't you kind of curious to know what it looks like? And so in verses 7 and 8, Moses says, Now the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance like the bedellium. bedellium. The people would go about and gather it and grind it between two millstones or beat it within the mortar and boil it in the pot and make cakes with it. And its taste was as the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Now, I thought maybe some pictures of, of what, what it is that Moses is describing here. He sees like, hey, the manna, it was like coriander seed. Well, what's coriander seed? Now, there's a picture of coriander seed. And then he says its appearance was like that of bedellium. Well, I would think that maybe what he's talking about here is maybe the shape of what this manna looked like was kind of like that of, of, of coriander seed, but the appearance, the color of it, the texture of it looked like bedellium resin. Needless to say, it was bread, miraculous bread-like substance given by God to the people on a daily basis. So here the Israelites were complaining about the menu. And did you ever notice something? This is something I think is, is so true. And people are people, aren't they? Uh, did you ever notice that complaining is contagious? You ever notice that? That if you find yourself around somebody who's negative, what happens to your attitude oftentimes? <laughs> Pretty soon your attitude becomes negative, doesn't it? And so, well, the people complained to Moses, and what do you suppose Moses is going to do? Well, look at verse 10. I don't know what your title of your, of your scripture is there, the, the title that's given there, but, but mine says the complaint of Moses. And that's what he's getting ready to do. Here in verse 10. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each man at the doorway of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. And Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on me, your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid this burden of all the people upon me? Was it I who conceived all this people? Was it I who brought them forth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing infant to the land of which he swore to their fathers? I think it's great. Here Moses is like, you want me to take care of these bunch of babies? I'm not their mother. That's what he's saying here. Verse 13. Where am I going to get meat to feed all these people? For they weep before me, saying, give us meat that we may eat. I alone am not able to carry all this people because it's too burdensome for me. So if you're going to deal with me like this, please kill me at once. If I found favor in your sight, and do not let, you, let me see my wretchedness. So here we have grown adults, including Moses, acting like a bunch of spoiled brats. And Moses is like, God, kill me, kill me now. And I'm like, Moses, get a grip. You're the leader of this nation of Israel. But even at this moment, at their worst, as they're complaining, as they're grumbling, as they're not satisfied, God's provision, God's supply, God's patience are monumental. So what does God do? Well, first thing he does is he provides some help for Moses. He gives 70 men to Moses to help him so he wouldn't feel so overwhelmed with the burden of being the leader. But as you, as you go on and you read more there, that that's not where God stops. God says, I'm going to provide meat to eat for these people for an entire month. In fact, they're going to have so much meat. There's going to be such an abundance of meat. They're going to grow tired of this soon because people just aren't satisfied, are they? And I love what Moses uh, says. He responds to God and he's like, in verse 21, uh, Whoa, God, well that sounds like a great plan and all, but there's a lot of us. I mean, there's like 600,000 men. That doesn't even include the women and the children. So how are you going to feed us all meat? There isn't enough livestock to feed us all meat for a month. And we could never catch enough fish. So how do you suppose you're going to do this? And I love God's response to the request of his people. Look at verse 23. The Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? 
Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So here's the request of God's people, and it's a big request. Give us meat. We're in the middle of the wilderness, but we want some meat. And that leads me again to ask of you, what big prayers have you asked of God? And as you pray big prayers, I want to tell you three things that may happen to you as you pray big prayers. And the first is this. When you pray big prayers, you may feel foolish. Because when you're praying big prayers, you're taking a risk. You remember last week I shared the story of Honey the Circle Maker? And Honey was infamous for standing inside of a circle that he drew on the ground with his staff and for telling God that he was not going to leave the circle until he brought forth rain. And that was a risky proposition. I, I mean, it wasn't a semicircle that Honey drew. He drew a complete circle. There was no escape clause. There was no expiration date. Honey backed himself into a, into a circle, and the only way out was for God to provide a miracle. And I want to let you know this morning that as you're praying big prayers, sometimes faith, well, it looks a little foolish. I mean, think about Noah building an ark. Hadn't rained, didn't even know what rain was, and here he and his family are working on a ship. Had to look like foolishness to his neighbors. The Israelites looked foolish, circling the city of Jericho six times, and on the seventh time, circling it seven times, and then blowing trumpets. That had to look a little silly. David, the shepherd boy, looked a little foolish wanting to go against Goliath, this mighty warrior, and fight him. The wise men had to look a little foolish following a star to Timbuktu. Peter had to feel a little foolish as he was getting out of the boat thinking, all right, here we go. And when you ask for the impossible, it will not make sense to a lot of people. When the doctors say it's terminal, or when the banks say you don't have the credit score, or when your spouse says you won't change, it's because in human terms it does not add up. In human terms, we've already determined whether or not this is going to work. Moses must have felt foolish commanding Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. He must have felt foolish as he's standing there at the Red Sea and he's raising his staff to divide it. He must have felt foolish promising meat to eat for the entire nation of Israel in the middle of the wilderness because it seemed not only unlikely, but impossible. But one thing I've learned is that people who use the word impossible haven't put God's power into the equation. Listen to what Paul says when he reminds the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. He says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. You see, people look at the things that are weak and they think, ah, oh, that's not going to be any good. How can God work with that? But see, when God grabs a hold of it, he adds his power into the equation and all of a sudden, wow, you're blown away. God specializes in the underdog. He takes situations that look hopeless and brings victory. He brings triumph out of tragedy. And all for his fame's sake. That's what bringing glory to God is all about. This was never more true than nearly 2,000 years ago as Jesus was hung on a cross dying. I mean, to the disciples who had abandoned him, it seemed like, well, this is the end. The cross looked hopeless to those who looked on. The end seemed imminent. But God's power brought hope to that situation. It was all part of God's plan, and Jesus Christ died, but that wasn't the end. Three days later, he rose back to life, proving that God truly does have the power over death, demonstrating that God not only forgives us of our sins, but also removes the sin from our lives with the blood-working power of his one and only Son. And so let me encourage you this morning that whatever circumstances you yourself find yourself in this morning, pray God to do the impossible. His power is so great that even the impossible is within your reach. Because if you're not willing to ask God for the impossible, you'll never experience the miracle. If you're not willing to step out of the boat, you'll never walk on water. If you aren't willing to circle the city, the wall will never fall. If you aren't willing to follow the star, you'll miss the, out on the greatest adventure of your life. 
And if you're continuing to pray small, tiny, safe prayers, you know what safe prayers are, don't you? Those are the kind of prayers that we pray, the ones that will come true even without God's assistance. If those are the kind of prayers we continually offer up to God, and those are the kind of prayers we're praying on a frequent basis, we've missed the boat. We will miss out. Take a risk. Pray big prayers. You may feel foolish, but if you don't, you will never know that God provides in a dramatic fashion. God provides in a dramatic fashion. You remember our story in Numbers chapter 11. We're about to go back there again, and we're going to see exactly how God provided for his people. Numbers chapter 11, verse 31. Now there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp. Let me kind of fill you in on what's taking place here so you can kind of understand the miracle and the way that God provided in dramatic fashion. The Israelites were parked in the desert of Paran, a region of about 50 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea and 50 miles southwest from the Dead Sea. I didn't know if you were aware of it or not. I wasn't until this week. But quail tend to live by water and they don't fly long distances. If it hadn't been for the supernatural wind that God brought to Israel, the quail would have never made it this far inland. I like what Mark Batterson says about the quail that God provided. Listen to what he says. He says, when quail get tired, they dive bomb. We're not talking about a perfectly angled duck that makes a smooth landing on a watery run runway. Quail were literally falling from the sky like huge pieces of hail. There had to be more than one bruised noggin on the day that it rained quail. And what a sight it must have been. But once, uh, but they only received because they asked. And they prayed big. And the Israelites were fortunate and blessed enough to get a small glimpse of the power that God has. And if you have not experienced God's miraculous provision in your prayer life, well then let me tell you, your prayers are small. Because when God provides, he will do so in a way that you know that it is God. Because there's no coincidences with God. God provides a miracle that only he and he alone can provide. That's God. So not only does God provide in dramatic fashion, but you need to jot this down this morning. God provides in dramatic proportion. Returning back to Numbers chapter 11, verses 31 and 32. Now there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, which was about a day's journey on this side, and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp, and about two cubits deep on the surface of the ground. The people spent all day, and all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered, least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. Uh, it's been said that you cannot outgive God, right? Well, God was more than generous with the quail that he provided that day. Let me put this in perspective for you. According to the Hebrew system of measurement, a day's walk, which is how far um, the scripture says the quail extended was a day's walk, is approximately 15 miles in one direction. So let me give this in perspective that we can relate to this morning. This is a picture of Hancock County. Okay? Now, if Carthage was the center of the camp and it was 15 miles in any direction a day's journey that the quail stretched, every place within the circle had quail. And not only had quail, but more impressively, had quail that was two cubits thick. What's a cubit? If you have a um, measure system down footnote at the bottom, it'll say a cubit's about 18 inches. So two cubits is 36 inches deep of quail. And we think eight inches of snow is rough to deal with. <laughs> so next time we get some snow, just tell your neighbor, could be worse, could be quail. <laughs> so three feet deep of quail stretching for a day's journey in any direction that you come. That's a lot of quail. It was like quail Mageddon, okay, is what we're dealing with here. And once the quail stopped falling, well, then the Israelites started gathering. Each Israelite, we're told, gathered no less than ten homers. How many of you not thought the 10 homers when he was like, oh, 10 homers, that's the homer. What in the world is a homer? That's a measurement we're not familiar with. 
A homer was about 11 bushels. One bushel is about approximately about four gallons, okay, of corn, whatever you might have. About four gallons is what it is. Um, how much quail was it? Well, it was enough that it took 600,000 men. That's all we know about men. Well, there may have been, obviously, so let's be conserved. Let's say there was 1.2 million. Let's double that, have the men and the women working together, some children who might be young men, young women. 1.2 million people all day and all night to gather quail that fell. Rough estimates would be that each person gathering, and this is some of the math that I, I worked up, would have gathered 176 five-gallon buckets worth of quail. That's a lot of quail. It took two days for nearly one and a half million people to gather all the quail up. That's a lot of quail. God doesn't just provide in dramatic fa fashion. He provides in dramatic proportion. Moses could have never anticipated this answer from God. It was unprecedented. But Moses had the guts to circle the promise anyway. He's like, all right, all right, I hear your, I hear your complaints. Let me go talk to God about it. And when you circle a promise that God has made, you never know how he's going to provide, but it's always cloudy with a chance of quail. You see, your job and mine is not to crunch the numbers and to make sure that God's will is going to add up and work out just the way we think it should because I have news for you. It won't add up and it won't work the way you think it should work because God's thoughts and God's ways are far superior to my thoughts and my ways. And so I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what's going on specifically in your life. But are you praying big? I want you to pray big. When you came in this morning, you probably saw the section that was on the north wall. There was three tables that was there, a sign that said prayer circles. One of the things I promised you as we're going through this sermon series is we're going to give you the tools necessary to be a people of prayer. Those three tables out there are part of the tools I want to give to you this month. Um, each of those tables, on each, each one of those tables represents three specific prayer needs. The first is Jairus Churchill. And you'll notice around each of those tables there are six chairs, okay? I'll get to that in just a second. One of the tables has Jairus Churchill, the son of Matthew and Sarah Churchill, has a hole in his heart, is going to need surgery, okay? I asked Sarah and Matthew, how can you pray? What specifically do you want us to pray for? She gave me a list of, of prayer requests. They're posted out there at the table. Second table is Tony Newton. You probably got the email update about myself and the elders. We went and saw him this last week. He is making progress. And I'm telling you, God's not done with that situation yet, but I believe that God is waiting for us to specifically ask and pray about specific things that Tony needs. So I asked Donna, what are some specific prayer requests we can be praying for you about with Tony? She gave me a list. They're back there on the table. The third table that is there is to be praying for Burnside Christian Church, our body. And there's a list of specific prayer needs there, the leadership, uh, to be praying for the elders, the deacons, the staff, uh, just to be praying that we would continue to be united, that we would continue to grow, not only spiritually, but numerically. I I'm excited about that, and I want you to be praying about that. Now, how do those tables work? Well, there are six chairs around a table. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but our church building remains unlocked every single day. It opens about 7 a.m., and it closes at about 9 p.m., unless there's something going on. I would love for you and your family to make a special trip out here to the church and sit around those tables and pray over each of those prayer requests. And you're thinking, well, Mark, why didn't you just give us the prayer list? We could take those home and pray over those. Well, here's why. Because if you're like me, you get the list of prayer requests. They go inside your Bible, and you don't see them until I'm preaching next Sunday. And you're like, oh, yeah, I need to do that. And then it, it, you never pray for them. And so what I want us to do is I want us to be intentional about our prayers. And I want you to, it, maybe make, what you can do is you can, if it doesn't work to come out during those hours, maybe you can make a, a point to be here an hour before church starts, before Sunday school starts. Sit at a table and pray specifically for God to intervene. Pray big. That's what we're talking about. And on those list of things there are some big prayers. I'm just going to warn you, okay? But I believe in a God who's big enough to answer big prayers. How about you? We're going to have a time of prayer here, and um, then we're going to have our time of decision. And uh, so I just want to pray for you this morning that, um, like I said, I don't know what situation you're facing, but I want to encourage you to pray big. Let's pray, and then we'll have our song of decision this morning.
Father God, we do thank you that you're a God who's big enough to um, hear our requests, Father, and do something about it. God, how, how patient you are to even hear complaints and respond in a mighty way. Help us to not be a people who complains, God, but help us to just share our heart with yours. Father, I pray specifically for Jairus Churchill. I pray, Father, for his healing, that you would intervene in his life long before doctors ever would. Father, I thank you for a family of faith, for Matthew and for Sarah. I just pray, Father, that they would be encouraged by a church family who is praying for them as well. God, may your power be made known in that situation to the doctors and the nurses and to Sarah and Matthew and to us as well. Father, I pray for Tony. I'm thankful for the progress he's made so far. But God, we're not satisfied. We want more. And I pray for Donna. I pray that as days go by that she would see your mighty hand of power at work as well. That each day that goes by, Tony would speak more that he'd have more movement in his left and right arms, Father, that he'd be able to stand on his own. Father, that um, his quality of life would be just as, well, just as great as it, as it was before the stroke. I pray, Father, that you'd return him back to your service as elder, Sunday school teacher. Father, we pray also for our church. So thankful for a church that supports its leaders, for a church that cares about the Bible and, and follows the Bible, who places authority of the Bible ahead of anything else. And Father, I pray that you'd help this church to grow. I pray, Father, that we would be a church that would be five, six hundred people, Lord, that not for our glory, not to say that look what we've done, but so that we could reach to people who, are need, who have needs that are great. Help us to remain united as we're facing changes and challenges of the future. God, help us to remain focused on what truly matters, and that is uh, Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Father, with those who are struggling with prayer requests of, of unspoken nature, I pray, God, that you show up big in their life as well. We thank you for the power of your word and the promises of your word. And we lean on those things here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.